August the 24th, our target was a railroad bridge over the Ferrara River in northern, in northern Italy. Uh, this was the flight that I went down on, and it isn't a particularly interesting flight because it wasn't a particularly important uh, target like uh, a ball bearing plant or an aircraft factory or something like that. It was just a railroad bridge. But it was a, apparently a vital railroad bridge because we knew that they had pretty heavy flak up there. And uh, it, had, it had a name uh, in, the, in the group as being pretty accurate. So we flew up the Adriatic coast and it wasn't, the target wasn't too far inland from the Adriatic. And we flew in and made it uh, practically 180 degree. In other words, our bomb run was coming back toward the Adriatic. This was not flak type, uh, barrage type flak. It was more of a radar type in which four guns are connected to a radar set and they will track you and try to hit you on the first time. Uh, our defense for this type of flak was what they call window. It's thin strips of aluminum foil that has a crimp in it, which makes it look like a straw. And it's dispensed, the, the gunners dispense it out the side windows by hand. They simply pick up hands full of this straw-like stuff and just dispense it out the windows. And it is supposed to throw off the radar and so that they can't get your airspeed and elevation. That's the two things they need. So they were dispensing window all over the place and we saw a burst ahead of us, quite a, quite a ways ahead of us and off to the left, this burst of four out there. Normally the second burst won't be quite on. By the third time they've got you bracketed. They know where you are and they'll get you. Well, we didn't see the second burst. The second one was on us, right on. And as far as the sound, I don't remember feeling a lurch of the ship. It was mostly sound. If, and the only way I can describe it would be to say if you were in a little wooden shed somewhere, inside the shed, and someone outside would take a, a rock or a brick and throw it as hard as they could against the side of the shed, that's the sound you would get inside. That, that's the only way I can describe what it was like to get hit with this thing. Uh, I had the outboard uh, port engine was shot, it was gone, got nothing. The inboard, inboard port engine, I got a little bit of power, just a little better than a feathered engine and the uh, rudder control was completely wiped out. I had no control from the foot pedals nor trim from the trim tabs. It was just gone. The uh, engineer told me that there was a piece of flak about the size of your fist that had gone into a brock, uh, chain and brocket assembly that controls the rudders just ahead of where I was sitting. Uh, since I, well, I, at, the, at the time, I sent the engineer down to see if he could pick out some kind of, some of the uh, cables and maybe tie them off, give me a little uh, thing so that I could hold a heading on the, uh, on the thing. Well, he went down and I don't know to this day what he did. He must have pulled them hard. He, he, I, don't, I don't know because the ship went into some kind of a maneuver that I can't even explain what it was. And honestly, I thought I was going to lose the ship. I thought I was going to completely lose control of this thing. They do occasionally, usually when you lose control, they go into a flat spin with the B-24 and there's no, no pulling out of it. They, it's just centrifugal force. There's no nose dime. It's flat. And uh, that's they do go into those sometimes. 
Well, I really had mis uh, thoughts of that, that it might, I might lose the ship. Uh, I did finally get control of it, but I had no way of holding a heading except to drop the wing on the opposite side of the drag, and this put me in a side slip, which is a maneuver, an alleged maneuver, but in order to hold this heading, I was losing about 600 feet a minute of altitude. So we got back out over the Adriatic this way, and we were flying down the coast. And uh, uh, I would hoped to be able to get back to the lines, and, and we'd just bail out. There was no way that I was going to be able to, brit to ditch uh, a crippled ship like this in the Adriatic. I was about to do that anyway. And so we were going to have to abandon the ship. That's the only way we'd have to do it. When we got down to 5,000 feet, I called a navigator and asked him how far we had to go, and he said we got about 65 miles, so we weren't going to make it. So I looked for an area that was wooded over and thought maybe we would have a chance to evade and get back to the lines and turned inland. As soon as we got over the, over the forested area, I hit the alarm button, and they just they were on standing on the the Bombay catwalk, and they just started tumbling out of that catwalk. Uh, that left the co-pilot and myself, and we had flak jackets and flak helmets scattered around on the flight deck. I don't know uh, why we had done that, but anyway, they were there, and I told the co-pilot to go, and he did. By this time, we were picking up some ground fire. And I found out when I went out that we had a fire in the Bombay from the ground fire. <clears throat> I started to go out, and incidentally, we, the pilot and co-pilot wore backpacks, and the radio, the uh, directional radio, is over the right over the little passageway between the pilot and co-pilot. I never went in or out of there as I didn't hook the backpack on that radio. And when I had told the uh, co-pilot to go, I started to get up, and the ship started to veer off to the right. And I knew that it's now or never. And uh, so I got up and pulled the, the trim back, the aileron trim, pulled it back, tri retrimmed it, I knew it was now or never, so I just out. And, and that's when I remember seeing fire over the Bombay. When I got down, one of the Germans that captured me reached over and did this, and I had, I was, the hair was all singed off my head. Uh, I guess when my chute opened, I had, had no idea. Well, I did have a little bit of an idea of what it was going to be like. At one of the bases, and I believe it was at BASIC, uh, one of the fellows that had washed out of paratroop training was packing chutes on the base. And so he gave us a little uh, kind of a lecture on how to uh, deploy your chute. And uh, he, he would teach you how to turn yourself in your chute so that you are drifting with the wind and how to land. You ra reach up as high on your shrouds as you can, and just as you're going to land, you jerk down hard, and that kind of breaks it. Landing in a parachute is the equivalent. You're going at the speed of about jumping off of an eight-foot platform, and that's about what the impact will be. So I was out, and I remember seeing this little flash of white and I knew my chute had deployed and popped open. And I guess I was about between 1,000 and 1,200 feet, something like that. And I started noticing ground fire, little spots of fire all over the ground. And I could hear the bullets. You know, they were shooting at us in the chute, at me in the chute. So uh, I just kind of slumped. Just maybe fool them into thinking they had got me. 
and went down and I landed in a little area. There was a kind of a little shed there and the Germans were bivouacked in this shed and there was a clothesline in there. I knocked that down. So when I landed, there was about five or six, eight guys standing there with their rifles pointed at me. So I decided not to try to uh, challenge them. <laughs>